welcome to Leadership PRN. This is the Dalhousie Faculty of Medicine's podcast for leaders new, emerging, experienced. My name is Dr. Lara Hazelton, and I'm a Director of Faculty Development within the Faculty of Medicine. Today, I'm very pleased to have someone with me who is not just a colleague, but also a friend, somebody I went to medical school with, um, Dr. John Sapp. Hi, John. Hi, Lara. And I'm really pleased that you're able to be here today. I've been wanting to have you join us on the podcast um, to talk about research, which I know is an area that uh, a lot of people are interested in, but sometimes put off a bit by the challenge of of leading research teams and, and the responsibility associated with that. So I'm wondering if you could tell us about yourself and your leadership role within the Faculty of Medicine. Well, sure. Um, I grew up in Halifax. Um, spent my youth here and uh, went away to Toronto for my undergraduate degree. Um, And then after graduation at U of T, came back to medical school uh, here in Halifax at Dalhousie, where I also did internal medicine and cardiology training, and uh, spent a couple of years at Brigham and Women's in Boston um, for a fellowship in heart rhythm, and then came back on faculty in 2002. We're the same age. (laughs) And uh, started, uh, started on faculty in the Division of Cardiology in the Department of Medicine as a heart rhythm specialist. And my main focus was uh, starting the complex ablation program here and advancing it uh, with a special interest in life-threatening arrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia especially. And uh, so that first um, starting a new program, that was one of your first, uh, I guess, sort of leadership experiences in a formal role, would you say? Um, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a formal role. It was a, uh, and it it wasn't a formal program. It was uh, the we had new technology and a lot of new knowledge over about a decade, and uh, we we got the equipment um, here before just before I before I came, and then we were able to implement a whole lot of sort of new complex procedures um, starting then. Hmm. Introducing a new program always has lots of challenges, I'm sure. There was a huge learning curve for all of us. And um, and initially our equipment was um, a lot of duct tape <laughs> and a really uh, amazing biomedical engineer who uh, kept it, who kept replacing the bits of duct tape until we uh, rebuilt the lab. Yeah. And now you have a role with the Faculty of Medicine. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, my role... Uh, there is as the assistant dean for clinical research. And uh, so my job there is to uh, do some of the background work uh, behind all of the clinical research that happens. Um, It's hard enough being a researcher, doing the clinical research, but for the institution to support ethical and effective research, there's a whole lot of other things that have to happen in the background, whether it's from kind of the rules and infrastructure around it, internal funding for it, going after grants, supporting grants, uh, administering grants, all of that's kind of happening in the background and supporting those of us doing clinical research. Um, Yeah, so that's my job is to help with some of that and uh, try to foster the development of clinical research um, and support our clinicians doing clinical research. And I uh, maybe I'll just add to that what I think is the fundamental importance of clinicians doing research. Clinicians do bring something to the research table. You know, somebody who's not in a clinical field doing doing research can have a huge depth of knowledge in that particular field. But what motivates many clinicians to do research is the patient experience and the, the direct need that we see where our current knowledge is inadequate where we're at, we see the frontier of knowledge and we know, hey, in this situation, I don't actually know what I should do next. And, and so is born the question, uh, boy, I guess we, we, need to answer this. we need to answer this question. We need to know better what to do or we need, we need to see better outcomes in this particular situation. And so I see research as pushing that frontier of knowledge, especially as a specialist where you sort of take your knowledge to the frontier of what's known in a particular field. Kind of feel if you're already at that frontier and you can see what the next step is, you should probably push the frontier and take a step. In a 
lot of the research you've done, um, I would imagine you've been the principal investigator, and that's a, a complex task. You mentioned that one of the things that you do in your current role is fostering and supporting others. Um, how did you develop the ability to successfully lead research teams? Um, I guess I'd take you back a step and say that clinical research is a team sport. And if you want to lead, you have to also follow. And um, I, d I don't honestly see it as a lot of uh, leadership. Um, it's collaboration. And uh, I guess if you, if you call it leadership, it really means you're the person who has to do the most work on any given, on any given project or study. And if you, I guess you could call it leadership if you're the push person who's really kind of pushing that forward. I think to be effective in clinical research, typically you're going to be an expert in that field. And then you start picking away at the problem, digging away at it, and then pretty much just keep digging. <laughs> and, and if it's an important trough you're digging, I guess uh, other people will want to help you. But equally important, I think, is to help other people with the rows there hoeing. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that um, it's a team sport, which I would completely agree with. Um, I don't have anywhere near the research experience that, that you've had, but I know sometimes um, sometimes the person leading the project sort of seems like maybe they aren't great at their, their skills at, as leaders. I don't know if you would agree with that, that sometimes the person who's leading the project maybe has some skills that they should be developing. Well, I guess in every field, there are people who are uh, experts and those that have uh, room to grow. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, um, so the people who've been successful, what are some of the things that you think that they do differently? Yeah. What are the, what are the features of yeah. uh, someone who's, who's pushing a research project that, that helps them be successful? Yeah. So if, yeah, if we talked about what are some success factors... I think um, there are some lessons to learn. Um, so relationships matter. If you want to play a team sport, it's really important that you have friends. You need them. Plus, it makes it a lot more fun. And as you work with other people, I think it's also important to do your best to make sure that they are getting as much out of the relationship as you are, or you know, at least that they're feeling like the effort that they put into the relationship is a positive for them. Yeah. So, so like I said, if you want to lead, you have to follow. So if you're dealing with other people who are also leading different projects, you want them to help you with yours. It'd be a good idea if you uh, did your best to support them in theirs. And then um, also there will be different things that people will consider a positive aspect of working with you. One, they might just enjoy seeing the research project go forward. Maybe it's important to them to be a named author. Maybe it's important that they have a role in a, some portion of the research. Maybe they uh, don't have time or the interest in doing a whole lot of extra work, but are, you know, just enjoy being part of developing new knowledge. So I think it's very different in every situation what, what makes a good research relationship what makes a good partnership, you know, as I said at the beginning, what makes it fun to, you know, why are, why would a busy clinician, you know, set aside some of their time that they, you know, where they could be sipping a hot chocolate at night uh, and instead do work? Well, hopefully it's because it's, you know, beneficial and it's fun. It sounds like understanding the motivations of everyone on your team uh, and what they value would be important. What a good insight, yes. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> I, I think also um, you're, uh, well, I don't want to say underselling yourself, but I, I know because I've seen you work over the years, I know the the effort and time that you said yourself, like that if you're the leader, you're the person who's doing all, a, a lot of the work of, of the team, right? You are collaborating, but there is a really important role for the leader. I seem to remember you getting some jackets made for your team. That was for our clinical team, but... Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for team building. Um, yeah, so for one of our studies, you know, we put, uh, especially early on, we were doing a trial of a, a technique called catheter ablation for one of for an arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia, 
And we made an effort to have um, investigator meetings. Um, and we made sure there was dinner and you know some social time there where we all had a common interest in in that procedure and we'd get guest speakers in. So you know we were all learning how to be better at at our craft as we were you know doing doing the study. And I, I think those that kind of networking that's not exactly behind the scenes, but um, you know creates the interstition that holds it all together, that holds the team together common experiences, common successes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because as you say, it's it's often added on for clinicians to something else that they're doing. Yeah, maybe even usually added on to something that they're doing. Do you think when you look back, you say that like your first project, which, which we'll say is like a, a learning um, experience in leadership, um, even if it wasn't research, when you look back at that, do you think that there were lessons that you took away that you now apply to leadership of of research projects? Yeah, I, th I think I uh, anything that I learned was by accident, to be honest. I think um, what I learned was um, more learning about research and um, maybe getting a little addicted to the thrill of new knowledge. I don't know if when you were a kid you ever took a rock and smashed it in two, and then you touch that surface and you know no humans ever touched it before, right? And uh, when you create new knowledge, you get this little aha moment where, you know, the results have just come in, and you just you suddenly know, haha, I know this thing that nobody nobody's ever known before, or nobody's proven before, or what you know, whatever. And um, there's an excitement to that, I think. Um, so maybe. I'll take the conversation back a little bit. My first experience in research was in uh, medical school. Um, I'd heard about research in my undergraduate degree, but I didn't have the opportunity or take it or find or make an opportunity to get involved. And then um, we had this great lecture. I'm sure you remember it well in, in uh, cardiac cellular electrophysiology. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, you remember that. I still revisit that <laughs> you periodically. Go look up the... <laughs> as a psychiatrist. As a psychiatrist, you look up the cellular, <laughs> cellular uh, ionic channel. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure you do. Anyway, uh, Susan Howlett gave us that lecture, and, um, and it was great. I thought it, it, was, it was interesting, exciting, and then uh, she had an uh, an opening in her lab for research that summer, and I um, had an opportunity to work with her, and you know, sort of caught some of her infectious enthusiasm um, for uh, for discovery research, and then kind of carried that on at a low level through the rest of my training because I was, you know, really busy with clinical training and trying to uh, learn how to be a good clinician, and then in Boston, it was really exciting to see. Really, they looked at every patient with an academic um, spirit. Like they looked at every patient with a okay. We know here's what we know what how to do, and also what can we learn? What can we learn from this complex situation? How can we get better at what we're doing? How can we how can we learn more? And um, that spirit of inquiry, I think, also infectious, and um, that I think is what kind of Im impelled me to keep going. And so um, when I uh, got back on faculty here, I took the opportunity to collaborate with the people who are already here and kind of keep uh, asking asking new questions. And, and as, I, as I say, I, I, I think that just came secondarily to doing the work. And then, you know, as, as you're doing the work, you know, necessity... Uh, leads to invention. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, if you want to get it done, you have to find ways to be effective. It sounds like maybe for you, both as a leader and someone learning to be a leader, um, role models would have been important. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, a number of fantastic role models in a whole variety of ways. So I, I mentioned Susan already. Uh, Martin Gardner was a fantastic role model and got me interested in uh, heart rhythm and Martin was a you know, really strong clinician, strong educator, and and researcher. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Milan Horacek was a uh, PhD researcher in uh, the Department of Physiology and Biophysics that I collaborated with a long time. And uh, Bill Stevenson as my uh, mentor in in Boston. 
and and still is. I was uh, on a call with him today about a project that we're that we're uh, collaborating on. So, um, and then once I got on faculty, um, I got more interested in doing clinical trials research. And uh, Tony Tang was leading a study out of Ottawa at that time, and I was our site PI. Learned a huge amount from taking part in that, um, and had an opportunity to do more work on the trial. This is usually how it works, right? If you, if you, uh, there's, there's always room for people to do more work. And uh, so, so I had an opportunity to do more work and that led to an opportunity to answer more questions and, you know, do some, uh, some sub, sub studies on that, on that trial. And, and um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, as we were saying earlier, probably, you know, we don't have to get into the people that were negative role models, but you probably saw some of those as well over the years, and and maybe that influenced you in some ways as deciding what you didn't want to do. Yeah, honestly, it's hard for me to think of any negative role models. Maybe that just doesn't stick. No, honestly, <laughs> I I can't I, I can't really think of negative si- situations. Projects that didn't go anywhere. Oh, I have lots of those. <laughs> 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 I think of it as irons you put in the fire, you know, and. Um, and lots of them just don't bear fruit. And lots of that's my own fault. It's just, you know, whether you don't put enough energy or work into it or, you know, things aren't going easily. Nothing goes easily typically, but, but um, yeah. No, there are lots of things that I've started and failed to finish. That's um, sadly a, um, reasonably common. <laughs> so you kind of hope that the ones that you manage to pull all the way through uh, kind of outweigh the, the the anchor ones. What advice would you have for junior faculty who want to pursue a career in research? Um, well, I think I'd start with saying it's a lot of fun. It really is. It really is a lot of fun. Um, you know, and and there's all kinds of sort of I don't know secondary gain that you get where, you know, I talked already about the kind of excitement of new knowledge, but it keeps going from there. So, you know, you've got some n- something new to say. You're an expert in a new thing, and um, you know there's an opportunity to travel, oftentimes to talk about it, to you know meet new people and collaborate with new people who have share common interest. Um, and um, yeah, that that whole part of the academic clinical world is really very interesting and and um, and rewarding. It's nice to know that. Especially nice to know sometimes that the work you're doing is influencing care beyond the patient right in front of you. As I said at the beginning, I think we're often, I am anyway, often driven by a clinical problem that I see that, you know, if I don't know what I should be doing, okay, well, can we figure out what we should be doing? How do we answer that question? And then if you answer it, you know, that can influence how other people practice medicine and how other people treat their patients. And so you might be influencing the care of patients, you know, far beyond your own clinical practice. So that is a really motivating, fun part of it is to to feel like you've made a difference. And well, I guess even to know that you have made a difference or contributed. Uh, so, So I guess I'd say that. I think the other thing I'd say is, um, if you want to, you know, if you want to be successful, you know, start by helping others, start by serving, start by, you know, if there's an opportunity to be a reviewer for grants or for a paper, just say yes. And you learn a lot from that. You learn what, you know, what's effective writing, what's effective communication, what's a, you, you learn a lot about research that way. And I guess the other, if there, you're asking for advice, I guess the other piece of advice would be to partner with people who are um, going to be mentors and um, to find people with complementary skill sets so that, you know, together you're stronger. And I think, you know, the it's hard to underestimate the importance of a good mentor. That that relationship can be really positive and really enabling. It's not 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 every relationship is, of course, but but an organically developed mentoring relationship usually you know, it needs some effort, but it also needs some good luck finding the right person, like any partnership. Uh, but that can be really enabling. Yeah, I think I was thinking about the luck aspects in mentorship and um, 
it's hard to know. I think, I mean, obviously there's some aspect of luck, but I think people can also make their own luck in uh, finding mentors as well. Yes, fortune favors the prepared, darling. (laughs) (laughs) And the mode. Yeah, that's uh, the incredible thing. (laughs) So when you're putting together a research team, how do you make sure that you have that, you know, group of people with complementary skills that can work together on the project? We talked earlier about uh, how important it is to have friends <laughs> and um, and to uh, reach out and just say yes a lot of times. And that those are ways that you're going to create a network where you discover people, where you meet people with common interests, people who might know something that or have a skill that you wish you had. <laughs> um, and that might be somebody that'd be you know great to work with. So that you know, that's happened for me a number of times where, you end up talking with somebody and realize, oh, wow, they really understand, you know, statistical analysis of this kind of thing, and maybe we should team up and do a study together. And then also, you'll want to be working with people who, you know, if you're at multiple sites, you need people who kind of have your skill set, but at somewhere else. So complementary location, complementary skills, I guess. And a lot of that comes from making relationships with uh, people who are interested in the same thing you are. So any final thoughts for um, people who are, you know, like I I said, I think that maybe you, perhaps it's come easy to you and you make it sound easy, but I think it's actually very challenging for a lot of people. So any final thoughts that you might have for people who want to, you know, aspire to achieving great things in research, research, which will involve leading teams in some way, right? Yeah, I'm not sure that it comes easily to anybody. I, I think you're going to spend, if, if you want to be successful, you're going to spend um, at least the first part of your career grinding. They call it grinding when video gamers, or gamers, wait, i got to get my nomenclature right. Gamers spend a lot of time grinding, you know, becoming expert at their game. And um, the first bunch of your clinical research career is a lot of grinding. You know, and it's a tough time. You come out of your training and you're learning a whole lot of new things, right? To be a uh, expert clinician, learning to be a, um, you know, a whole bunch of new responsibilities, a whole bunch of new roles that you've, some of, some of which you've had little preparation uh, for. And um, while you're doing that, you're also trying to get a, you know, research projects off the ground. It's tough. That's part of why we're putting putting on the research mentorship colloquium uh, through the faculty, through the medical research development office, um, and we're engaging early career clinicians uh, who are interested in research. Uh, they bring with them the mentor, so it's an organically developed mentoring relationship. We're not imposing mentors, and we bring them together, and we're walking through the development of a research project. Every every couple of weeks, we'll get we get together. We just had our first. Um, for a session of this year, uh, this week. Thanks for joining us here today, John. It's been a pleasure to talk with you about this. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. So that's another episode of Leadership PRN. If you have a topic you would like to hear me cover or someone you think I should speak to, please feel free to reach out to me at lara.hazelton at nshealth.ca or lara.hazelton at dal.ca. Until next time, take care.